Pray to. The sharp cleansing smell of fire fills your awareness. Mixed with the offerings of incense and oils, along with the rich smells of chapati being cooked, chai being steamed, cow dung being burned for fuel. You open your eyes and the old man with the silver coins has returned, bringing you fresh coals from another fire to light your hookah. You prime the pipe as the old man waits patiently. He wants to know more of the lions and their adventures. You decide to take him with you on the journey this time. When the smoke is ready, you offer him a seat on the cushion. A young prince sits on the bank of the Naranjara River beneath the shadow of a crescent moon. He eats a small meal and leans back beneath the flowering tree. He is troubled by human suffering and by the inevitability of sickness and death. So much so, he has walked away from his future throne and his wealth. Every day he comes to this place and he sits. Gradually, the great fire fades into the earth and the silver of the moon steadily grows brighter. He looks for answers in both of them and also all around him, in the flowers, the trees, and the stars in the sky. One evening, after many days, he notices two lions on the opposite bank of the great river. The lions also lay beneath a small tree. He cannot tell from the distance whether they are watching him, but they face his direction. He imagines he and the lions are kindred, that like him, they are searching the landscape for answers. <clears throat> this thought gives him comfort. Perhaps all beings struggle with the existence in their own way. His heart settles for the moment, and he gathers himself up and finds a place to, to sleep. Each afternoon, he returns to the tree beneath, uh, besides the river, and as the sun begins to set, the lions join him. Each day, he studies the Vedic verses and considers their counsel that he should escape the physical world. He follows these teachings, but finds no lasting comfort. He denies himself physical pleasure, but finds no peace. These exercises only bring him more discomfort. The three companions continue their nightly ritual throughout the opening and closing of the moon's eye. Then one day, as the young man sits beneath the Bodhi tree, admiring one of its blood-red flowers, the separation between himself and the flower dissolves. He sees that life does not lie behind a looking glass. The flower is still a flower, yet it is no longer only a flower. He sees that there is no need to seek to possess the beauty of the flower, to long somehow to be made whole by its beauty. Tree, river, flower, bird, lion, sky, moon, heart, raven, song, wave, leaf of grass. He sees to see these things as individual items, separate from himself. And as he does, he sees them clearly for the first time. Eventually, he looks across the river. The lions stand at attention. In their knowing gaze, he understands that beauty is inherent in all life. He sees that beauty's gift has always been there. He recognizes that happiness is found not just in acceptance of the impermanence of everything, but in rejoicing in this fact. By re reveling in the reality that beauty will never stop its intoxicating dance, and that freedom is the ability to love this second and next equally. The young man bows to his twin companions. They lower their heads in return. The would-be king eventually becomes known by many names, including Enlightened One, Buddha, and the ninth avatar of Vishnu. 
Though he writes down nothing, his stories and teachings are passed on by others. And though he cares nothing of this, there is poetic irony in that, had he remained a prince, with all his wealth and power, his story may never have been told. 